Today, I wanna to talk about how powerful should your PC be. I like to make content that's meant for people who are brand new to the PC platform. I used to be somebody who was brand new to the PC platform, and trust me, I get it. You have a lot of questions, and that is totally okay. Do you go with Nvidia or AMD on your graphics card? Do you go with AMD or Intel on your CPU? It can definitely be just a little bit overwhelming, and trust me, I definitely get it. So I'm hoping to answer at least one of those many questions today. We're talking about how powerful should your PC be? Now, a lot of people will word this another way and say, how much money do I need to spend on my PC? And that is definitely a fair question as well. Nobody wants to overspend if they don't have to, right? Okay, so when it comes to figuring out how powerful should your PC be, there's multiple different approaches that you can take. And the first approach I wanna talk about is the latest and greatest. Now, this is arguably the easiest approach, but it's also the most expensive. Now, the benefit of this is the fact that you'll be able to run any game on the market for the foreseeable future. And you don't have to worry about the headache of checking minimum and recommended system specifications anytime a new AAA title is coming out that you really wanna play. That's a wonderful thing, and, and it definitely gives you peace of mind. But the downside is that you definitely run into a wall of diminishing returns. You're not getting the best bang for your buck, so value is completely out the door. And honestly, it's a lot of money. It's going to cost you a lot of money. And so many people don't really wanna do that option because I mean, who wants to spend more money than they have to, right? Now, the second approach that you could take when it comes to trying to figure out how powerful your PC should be is to simply Make a list of games that you know you wanna play. Maybe it's Warzone, maybe it's Fortnite, maybe it's Elden Ring, for example, and look up the minimum and recommended specifications for those games. And of all the games, pick the game with the most demanding recommended specifications and build your PC based on that. And the reason why I make that suggestion is because it will allow you to play any game on your list without issue and it will allow you to do it as cheaply as possible. The downside to this approach is it doesn't leave you any room for future compatibility or future proofing of any kind. What happens if a new game comes out that you really wanna play, but its minimum specifications are already higher than your entire system specifications? Well, in that case, you're not gonna be able to play the game. And so now you'll have to go buy a brand new graphics card or a brand new CPU or maybe both. And so that could put you into a prediction where you just built the PC and you already feel like it's out of date. And so that could be annoying. So that is definitely something to be mindful of if you take this approach. And the last and final approach that you can take and the one that I most highly recommend is to simply build a PC that matches a console. For example, the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 are the latest and greatest gaming consoles on the market right now. And for better or worse, love it or hate it, however you feel about console gaming versus PC gaming, the fact of the matter is consoles set the standard, point blank, period. Consoles sell millions of units every single year. They're easy to use, they're easy to understand, they're incredibly affordable, and in many cases, they have exclusives that have not yet been ported over to the PC platform. If you build a PC that matches the hardware of the consoles, any game that comes out that is multi-platform that will run on a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X will also be able to run on your PC. The Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 have very respectable hardware. They are both running on AMD custom architecture for the CPU as well as the GPU. Both consoles have an eight core CPU with 16 threads and both consoles have a custom AMD RDNA 2 GPU. The PlayStation 5 has a GPU that offers 10.3 teraflops and 36 compute units, while the Xbox Series X has a GPU that offers 12 teraflops flops and 52 compute units. Both consoles have 16 gigabytes of RAM that is shared throughout the whole system. Both consoles have high-end SSDs. The Xbox Series X has one terabyte of storage and the PlayStation 5 has 825 gigabytes of storage. As I said before, both consoles have a custom architecture from AMD. That means we do not have any components on the shelf that matches this custom architecture identically. However, we do have some things that come incredibly close, and we're going to talk about that starting right now. Now, from a CPU perspective, both consoles are using the Zen 2 architecture, and in order to get a CPU that matches that architecture for your PC that has eight cores and 16 threads, you could buy the 3700X or the 3800X. In fact, for the prices that I'm able to find right now, it would actually be better for you to go one generation newer 
and buy Zen 3 and get the AMD Ryzen 5000 platform. You can get the 5700X or the 5800X. I personally have a 5800X in my PC and I can definitely vouch that it is truly a phenomenal CPU. Now, from a GPU perspective, things get a little bit more interesting. AMD definitely deals in compute units and teraflops. And unfortunately, Nvidia does not deal directly in compute units. They have CUDA cores, which doesn't necessarily translate the exact same way, but we can still look up teraflop information. Now, first of all, let me just put this out there and say that a teraflop is not necessarily the best methodology for being able to tell how powerful a graphics card can be. It doesn't really paint an accurate picture. Now, if you're sticking with the AMD architecture, you could go with an AMD 6700 XT. And what this will do is give you 40 compute units and 13 teraflops. What this allows you to do from a compute unit perspective is fall right in the middle of an Xbox Series X and a PlayStation 5. And from a teraflop perspective, you actually exceed the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5. Now, if you wanna save a little bit of money and take it a step lower, you could get the non-XT version of the 6700. And this would allow you to have 36 compute units and 11.29 teraflops. From a compute unit perspective, it matches the PlayStation 5 perfectly. From an Nvidia perspective, there are a few cards you could buy to fit this build. My personal recommendation would be the RTX 3060. It has 12 gigabytes of VRAM, it has 12.7 teraflops, and it's running on the latest and greatest Nvidia 30 series architecture, which is obviously only the latest and greatest until the 40 series comes out. Or you can try your hand at the used market and pick up a 2070 Super, a 2080, or a 2080 Super, but sometimes buying used can be a little bit of a headache, and not to mention you have no idea if those cards have been mined on or not. Now to wrap things up, you may be asking the question, well, can it do 4K60? Well, and to that, I would say, first of all, even the new consoles do not always run every game at 4K60. Spider-Man Remastered on the PlayStation 5 in the fidelity mode only runs at 4K30. So 4K30 is still being used as an acceptable target even on the next gen consoles. Now, of course, you could argue, well, there's a performance mode for Spider-Man that runs at 60 FPS, and that's true. But in that performance mode, some of the graphic settings have been turned down, dynamic scaling resolution is now implemented, and there's multiple different tricks like that behind the scenes that go on with consoles that allow them to make these advertisements of 4K 60. So just know if you go with a 3060 or if you go with a 6700 XT, you may not always be able to run games at a native 4K with everything maxed out and get a 60 FPS lock. And honestly, that's fine because if I was going for this build, I would plan to play mostly around 1440p. The 3060 will do a great job at 1440p gaming. The 6700 XT will do a great job at 1440p gaming. And of course, they will both do even better if you drop down to 1080p gaming, which is where most PC gamers are still gaming even to this day. Now, do me a favor, hop in the comment section down below this video and let me know which one of these methodologies applies most to you whenever you're looking to build a PC. Is there another methodology I didn't cover? Is there something wrong with something that I've said? I'm looking forward to hearing back from you down below. Keep it civil, but let's have a good, intelligent conversation. If you like this video, do me a favor and hit the like button because it goes a long way in helping me out. If you're new here, consider subscribing and becoming part of the community. I would absolutely love to have you. And until next time, E-Rock out.